Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Last time we talked about some of the problems that William Kidd faced when leaving London. And they may have seemed small, but they really weren't. The issues he faced upon departing London were some of the most consequential events in his career. You know, aside from the piracy. Mostly, though, they were so important because they came up in later court proceedings pretty prominently. They might be a bit overblown, in fact, probably are, but the court spent a lot of time focused on those events because there were so many respectable witnesses to which they could turn. When William Kidd refused to dip his sails or to fire off a salute before a Royal Navy yacht, and then before a royal ship of the line. Then when his crew of top-quality scallywags mooned that warship. And then when that navy captain took all of his sailors and, after weeks of waiting, replaced them with a crew of dregs, sickly, rebellious, and with no discipline to speak of, they were pirates, not to say that they'd actively been involved in any actual acts of piracy. As far as we know, they hadn't. But in their temperament, in the question of their character. And it's that which I'd like to begin with today. This is episode 229, The Restlessness of Pirates. I'm guilty of a pretty big historical sin, and I know I'm guilty of it, and it bugs me, but I do it anyway. When I started doing this show, I wanted to spend a lot more time talking about regular pirates, lower crewmen on board pirate ships, not to focus as much on the captains as one typically sees in pirate sources. And since we have to rely on those sources, there tends to be this centralization of character, this protagonism given to the captains, and of course the romanticization that pirate captains have always enjoyed. And I fall prey to that myself more than I would like to. But today we're going to begin to correct that, at least a little bit. We're able to do so because the crew of the Adventure Galley is noteworthy. The pirates on board Fancy, for example, certainly were not nice guys, but our best sources about them come from their own testimonies, in which they defended their character before the court. But in the case of Adventure Galley, we have other sources, those that came from men who well, usually had an agenda, who had something to gain by criminalizing and demonizing these pirates, in this case in particular from William Kidd. So could we really trust what he has to say about the character of the men who were foisted upon him by a Royal Navy captain and those he picked up later? And of course, really, we can't, but it is what we have. And those sources, from Kidd to the colonial government of New York to the Admiralty of England, well, they would all have us believe that these pirates were, to a man, rotten. To their core, rotten. And maybe they were. They were, after all, pirates. And I know I can occasionally be guilty of giving these murderous sea robbers a coat of blue-collar paint, you know, just regular guys trying to make good in the world, some of them trying to provide for their families with terrible circumstances imposed upon them, and sometimes that's true, but sometimes they just wanted to rob and kill. All of which is to say we know a bit more than usual about the men on board Adventure Galley. Those thirty or so sailors who were foisted upon William Kidd may not have been the best of the bunch, but they were capable sailors, at least good enough to get him across the Atlantic Ocean from London to New York in reasonable time. By late April 1696, 
the adventure galley was pulling in to New York Harbor. Now, we don't know a whole lot about what Kidd got up to in his personal life upon his return. You know, certainly he spent time with his wife Sarah and his young daughters. And I'm sure he had friends to see and business to attend to, but what I'm really curious about is Governor Fletcher. See, Benjamin Fletcher was away from New York when Kidd arrived. He was either in Philadelphia or in Albany. I've seen both, and it looks like he may have taken two trips at just about the same time. What I'm really interested in here, though, is this question. Did William Kidd know about Benjamin Fletcher's planned removal from office and replacement? Those decisions had already been made, but it was not yet officially announced. And it looks like Benjamin Fletcher did not yet know that the Earl of Bellamont had been appointed to take his office. And I doubt anyone in London was trumpeting that fact in front of William Kidd. But, you know, secrets do have a way of getting out. William Kidd did not tell anyone in New York City about Lord Bellamont, which might suggest that he didn't know. But even if he did, even if one of those grandees with which he had had some dealings in London had let slip this bit of news, it would have been really foolish on the part of William Kidd to begin making waves when he arrived in New York. You know, this Earl of Bellamont is about to take up the governorship, and you really don't want to antagonize your new boss right before you begin a big project. But while we don't know much about Kidd's personal life and doings upon his arrival in New York, we know a good deal more about what he got up to with New York's underbelly, with some of their more notorious denizens, and some of the Atlantic world's most wanted. The Adventure Galley's crew from England was not big enough, or healthy enough, or really skilled enough to engage in privateering and pirate hunting. William Kidd needed a crew that not only knew their way around a ship, but knew their way around the chase. Moreover, they needed to know how to fight. He needed gunners for sea battles, but he also needed some tough customers who wouldn't lose their nerve behind a cutlass and who knew how to swing that cutlass. Now, if they had been in Boston, say, or or St. Kitts or Jamaica at this point, they probably could have found a crew of battle-hardened privateers that were there to fight for king and country and plunder. Maybe they could have, but they weren't in Boston or St. Kitts. They were in New York, Benjamin Fletcher's New York. Captain Kidd wasn't going to find any virtuous men with the skill set he needed. Captain Kidd was going to have to turn to sea rovers. Now, normally, there would have been a plethora of pirates available in New York, a buffet of buccaneers, a... Cornucopia of Corsairs. It was, after all, the port of call for more than a few pirate ships. However, here in the early months of 1696, just shortly after Ganji Sawai was captured, so many of New York's most talented seafarers were currently hiding out in Madagascar, or else somewhere out at sea. So kids' options here were kind of limited but he turned to a pirate that he knew pretty well, a man that he may or may not have fully trusted, but that he knew was up to the task. This sailor's name was John Brown. Now, if you were to Google something to the effect of John Brown pirate, you'd be unlikely to find this guy. He's not super well documented. And more to the point, there are other options to choose from. Back in the 1670s, in the aftermath of the Franco-Dutch War, a privateer named John Brown took a commission from Saint-Domingue Governor de Grand. Now, this John Brown chose not to stop sailing, 
when King Charles II barred English mariners from taking commissions from foreign princes, an act which made him, legally speaking, a pirate. An arrest warrant was issued in Port Royal, and eventually that John Brown was hunted down. A bit of a shame, he quite likely would have sailed with the Pacific Adventure if he'd been given the opportunity, and he almost was able to do so anyway. On the day of his execution, Speaker of the Assembly of Jamaica, William Beeston, was petitioning Lieutenant Governor Henry Morgan for a stay of execution. Morgan, in defiance of the governor, granted the stay of execution and sent a messenger rushing down to the gallows to put a stop to affairs. But when that messenger arrived, John Brown was already hanging. There are as well going to be two additional pirates called John Brown during the Pirate Republic at Nassau, one of which was a prominent sailor aboard the Widda. And all three of those pirates show up before our John Brown, but atop them all, before any of them, there's another character that appears when you Google John Brown Pirate. He's not a pirate, he's a blacksmith, that appears in Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. He's that blacksmith that Orlando Bloom works for, the, the old drunk who knocks out Jack Sparrow after the sword fight in the smithy, who gets all the credit for it. Not a major character, I don't even remember if he had any lines, but indulge me for a second here. In the future, this John Brown, our John Brown, the one in New York with whom William Kidd was talking, well, he was going to retire to Jamaica and open up a business. Exactly what that business is isn't clear. He was a merchant of some kind. Now, I doubt that he would have learned how to smith on board a pirate ship, but who can say for certain? Maybe, maybe his father was a blacksmith before he took up the pirate trade. And it would hypothetically fit the Pirates of the Caribbean timeline for this John Brown to be the very same from that movie. All of that aside, this John Brown, our John Brown, and William Kidd had quite the history. John Brown was aboard the Blessed William back in 1689 when Robert Culliford, William May, and Edward Coates stole her out from under Captain Kidd. He was still aboard when the crew overthrew Captain Culliford in favor of Samuel Burgess, and when they sold Blessed William to purchase the Jacob, and finally when they sailed for the Indian Ocean and Madagascar. John Brown was still aboard when Jacob sailed for the coast of Africa, and when they were ambushed by that Mughal cavalry unit, when Robert Culliford was captured. No, I don't like that. Let's try... When Robert Culliford was captured. No, how about when Robert Culliford was captured? Yeah, that's it. Got it. Oh, wait, did I... Is this thing on? Well, at least now you all remember that six years prior to this event... On the coast of Mughal, India, Robert Culliford was captured. In his book, Captain Kidd and the War Against the Pirates, Robert C. Ritchie writes, quote, John Brown typified the restlessness of those pirates who found it difficult to enter another trade when their money ran low. Brown had lived on his loot after the Jacob returned from the Red Sea in 1693, but like so many former pirates, he went back to sea when his money was spent. Kidd's privateering offered Brown another chance at plunder, and he offered Kidd actual experience in the Indian Ocean and Red Sea. End quote. Now all of that is 100% true, factually speaking. John Brown did indeed offer experience, real-world experience in that part of the world, and William Kidd's voyage did offer an excellent opportunity for plunder. The question here is, though, 
whether or not John Brown had this legal, legitimate pirate hunting and privateering in mind, or was it merely the opportunity presented by this new ship filled with guns and a whole bunch of privateers? You've all heard that old fable, right? I've usually heard it from the point of view of an old Native American story, where there's a, sometimes a scorpion, more often a venomous snake, usually a rattlesnake, that needs to cross a river. But of course a rattlesnake can't swim across a river. It needs something to help carry it across, and, you know, it'll ask a duck, hey, can you help me cross the river? And the duck will say, no, you're just going to bite me. It'll try two or three more until a human appears. And the rattlesnake says, hey, will you help me get across this river? And the human says, no, you're just going to bite me. And the rattlesnake says, no, no, I'm not going to bite you. Not if you help me out and get me across this river. And the human, a trusting creature, agrees and carries this rattlesnake on its back across the river, at which point the rattlesnake promptly bites them. And the human says, why would you do this? I helped you. You said you wouldn't bite me. And the rattlesnake says, yes, I did, but... I'm a rattlesnake. Captain Kidd needed men who knew how to sail, and in New York that meant pirates, but should he ever have trusted this rattlesnake who, let's not forget, had bitten him before? But then again, it is curious that John Brown did not sail with Henry Every and the rest of his fleet when he was preparing his voyage. And I wonder why. I think it's possible, maybe even likely, that there was some bad blood between John Brown and William May. The return leg of the voyage of the Jacob, back in 1693, was contentious. There was arguing over the spoils, and some of the men began to fight over gambling debts. They got really drunk on cheap rum and fought over the plunder. But even more so, when the Jacob returned to New York, there were some pretty severe arguments over just how to split the profits of the sale of the Jacob. Arguments that turned violent in the taverns and streets of New York. William May was on the winning side of those arguments. He got most of the profit, while John Brown and his friends did not. If that informed John Brown's feelings toward men like William May, it might explain why William Kidd was even willing to speak to him. John Brown also had something else to offer. He wasn't just a single skilled mariner, which he was, but he had maybe half a dozen other men that were in his camp, men who also knew their business. Moreover, he had contacts in the New York pirate scene. He had plenty of other prospects that might want to join the crew, but they did have to be enticed. Last time, I told you about a clause in William Kidd's contract with his investors, a clause that limited the percentage of whatever plunder they plundered from pirate ships that Kidd was legally allowed to give to his crew. Now, in London, this clause wasn't a big deal. They weren't handing out privateering commissions in England, so skilled sailors were happy to sign up for what would have been in other times a paltry sum. They lined up for the opportunity to do so. But in New York, privateering was not rare. Benjamin Fletcher was handing out 100% legal commissions to 100% legitimate privateers, to any man who owned a ship and agreed to give him a cut. They were going to require more than a paltry sum for this actually mostly legal privateering mission. So Captain Kidd made a decision. He chose to raise the shares that he would offer to his crewmen. Now that's a huge decision. He was breaking his contract with his investors almost as soon as possible before he'd really begun his voyage, and admittedly, thanks to that Navy captain, he didn't really have a choice here. But add to that his decision to 
fail to salute two different royal ships and a pattern does begin to form. The wages were big, though, big enough that sailors began to flock to New York. At one point, when Governor Fletcher wrote to the governor of East Jersey, an independent colony that had close ties to New York, but he wrote, looking for conscripts to help fight the war, the governor of East Jersey wrote back that the, quote, large wages that Captain Kidd offered were luring his men away, and that, quote, several are gone aboard, Captain Kidd. One of the men who decided to sign up with Captain William Kidd, was Hendrik van der Huel, a Dutch merchant sailor who chose to defect from his own vessel to the adventure galley for those larger wages. Van der Huel did have some pull and brought a few of his own men to the crew, much like John Brown, and that gave him an advantage. A few weeks later, as they were about to set sail from New York, the crew would vote Hendrik van der Huel to quartermaster of the adventure galley. Now, it was probably a good decision, at least for the men voting for him, but it was going to be a decision that had some serious ramifications. Now, as an aside about Hendrik van der Huel, he was described in one source as, quote, a small black man. And some authors have taken this to mean that he was black, of African descent, which might be true, but black rarely meant black back then. You know, much more likely, in the parlance of the times, they would have called him a negro. Oftentimes, black just meant that they had dark hair, think, you know, black Irish, or it meant that they were just deeply tanned, I think it's more likely that van der Huel, though, was of mixed race. There's a theory that I agree with that his mother was a freedwoman in New Amsterdam. That's where van der Huel was born, to a Dutch father and probably a mother of African descent. But if he was, in fact, of African ancestry, you will sometimes, often even, see some sources claim that van der Huel was the highest-ranking privateer of African descent yet known. And this is just not true. There are a couple of other quartermasters I could point to prior to Hendrik van der Huel, but let's take that a step above. We can point to a couple of privateer captains. There was Roque Brasiliano, who was probably at least of partially African ancestry, he was one of the captains that sailed alongside Henry Morgan to march on Panama. And then, of course, there was Diego Lucifer, who I usually choose to call Diego Lucifer because it is much more palatable than the name by which he was more commonly known in his own lifetime, Diego the Mulatto. You may recall that it was, in fact, his mixed-race heritage that saw him barred from certain social standings in the highly rigorous Spanish encomienda system. That's the reason that he stole a ship, set sail, and worked his entire life as a privateer-slash-pirate against the colonial American Spanish. So van der Huel, while he may have been black, was certainly not the highest-ranking privateer of African ancestry yet to sail. In addition to van der Huel, though, there were other Dutch sailors. One Dutch privateer complained to the governor of New York that one of his sailors, a man named Franz Cordijn, another Dutchman, had left his service in favor of the adventure galley. There was one big problem for William Kidd, though. Supplies. Adventure galley found herself in need of everything— and William Kidd didn't want to shell out mostly his wife's money for all of those supplies. Especially since he was offering a fortune to his crewmen. You know, why should I pay for your lunch when I'm paying you so much already? So if you were to get a spot on the adventure galley, you had to bring in some vittles. You had to bring in some booze and really anything else that the ship might need. Cordine, or maybe it's just Corden, 
but he brought in a bunch of goods when he signed up, as did Hendrik van der Hule. But not just anyone was able to afford casks of rum and salted pork. You know, there were a bunch of sailors who may have wanted to sign up, but didn't have the capital to buy the supplies needed. But a ton of merchants from the region found a way to make this clause work for them. One famous example saw three day laborers from Philadelphia arrive at the docks with casks of wine and exotic spices, and notably for each of them, a chest of trade goods including, quote, shoes and stockings, rum and sugar, spices, combs, knives, handkerchiefs, spoons, and ropes. But of course, none of that stuff belonged to them. These three men, uh, Patrick Dremmer, Micah Evans, and Samuel Kennels, were not rich. They couldn't afford spices and chests full of trade goods. They were way too poor for any of that. All of those goods belonged to their employer, a Joseph Blydenbaugh. And each of these men owed Blydenbaugh for all of their trade goods, and in addition they owed him, quote, one-third portion of his share in money, jewels, or bullion, negroes or slaves, and silks. Now, that's not great. You know, a third of your wages have to go to your boss, but it's not terrible. They got two-thirds, after all, and likely it was an opportunity they wanted to take up anyway. Maybe they even negotiated that deal with their employer. Now, there were other New York merchants who chose to invest in the voyage without sending any men to sign up. One notable example was a merchant named Thomas Clark, fairly prominent New York merchant who actually shared a pew, or at least a, a row, at the Trinity Church with the Kidd family. He invested a sizable sum and was expecting a sizable return. And... While this is not at all relevant, Thomas Clark's nickname, thanks to his chosen trade, was Whisking. As in, I believe, the King of Whiskey, which may be the coolest name ever recorded. Now, while all of that is mostly fine, it does begin to get a bit gross when you look beneath the surface. There was a policy in New York, really in most of the polities of the Atlantic world, in which any sailor who had an outstanding tab in a tavern, of a certain size for a set number of weeks at least, but they could be sold into indentured servitude for the low, low price of someone paying off their bar tab. Now, usually this was restricted to sailors. You know, a guy from London might sail to Boston on board one ship and then spend several weeks whiling away his pay in the brothels until someone came along who needed men for another voyage and that man would pay off his outstanding debts. But a bunch of these guys got conscripted for the adventure galley, not by William Kidd, but by men who were looking to earn a portion of their income. You know, someone would wake up to a banging on their door one day, and someone was standing there saying, Hello, I paid off your tab. You're going to go sail with William Kidd, and when you come back, you owe me half of whatever you made, and enough money to pay off your servitude. But there is even worse to come. Richard Zacks writes in The Pirate Hunter, quote, On August 24, Captain Kidd and half a dozen veteran sea dogs, who had already agreed to accompany him on the voyage, were sitting around drinking in the tavern of Michael Hawden. At some point in the evening, tavern owner Hawden struck a deal with Kidd. He called over his young apprentice serving boy, Saunders Douglas, and told him he would be sailing round the tip of Africa and hunting pirates in the Red Sea. The laughing men teased the boy about how seasick he'd get and how he'd spend nights freezing in the crow's nest, picking icicles out of his hair. The agreement signed by Kidd and Hawden states that the master Hawden would receive half of one share of the booty 
for supplying his servant. Douglas would receive nothing except the knowledge that he had chipped away a couple more years off his indenture. Young Saunders would be among the first to die on the voyage. End quote. Kind of a tragic case there, but certainly not the only one on board Adventure Galley. This ship and this voyage were not the beacon of democracy and brotherhood that we might expect from other pirate ships in the era. Although there were, of course, men on board who, well, wanted it to be. And there are a bunch more crew members that we know about from the Adventure Galley, and we are going to introduce all of them in time. Among that group we will find the real troublemakers, but imagine that. Imagine that you're a sailor who racked up a tab in a local tavern, or a 14-year-old servant boy, indentured servant boy. Maybe you're just a day laborer who was getting sick of spending all his days digging ditches. But you're basically forced onto this boat, where the work was probably going to be even harder, where out in the middle of the ocean you're going to see some of your comrades die in battle. And then, in the midst of all of that, feeling unhappy and disgruntled, disenfranchised, you're listening to one of the men on board who starts talking some real sense. Talking about what life would be like on this ship if only they were allowed to do what they really wanted to do. Now exactly what that entails, we'll have to wait and see, but don't you think you might be just a little bit more pliable to those kinds of suggestions in those circumstances? Because all of the names we've mentioned here today, and many, many more men on board the Adventure Galley, were indeed going to be very pliable. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show. Everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon. All of you who have left ratings or reviews for the show, you all help get it noticed. I couldn't do it without you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, why not do so at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. As always, most importantly, thank you for listening.